And joining us now here in studio, Steven Pinker, author of The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. He's also the John Stone Family Professor in the Psychology Department at Harvard University, and it's great to have you back in our studio. Thank you. You were here with your last book, I think, a few years ago, and it's great to see you again. Thank you. Where did the notion, because it's so counter everything we hear, where did the notion come to you that we may actually be living in more peaceful times than we think we are? I, all of these facts kept uh, coming to my attention, and I, it, it started to feel like a conspiracy. So I knew that, uh, that there'd been a huge reduction of violence when the first states imposed control over territories and put an end to tribal and raiding, raiding and feuding among uh, hunter-gatherers, that uh, contrary to stereotype of uh, Native people living peacefully in, uh, in, in their ecosystem, there was an awful lot of... Uh, of um, warfare leading to rates of death that were far higher even from our world wars. I also knew that rates of homicide had come down since from the Middle Ages to the present, that a contemporary Englishman has about one thirty-fifth the chance of being murdered as his medieval ancestor. And we all know things that, you know, slavery was abolished and cruel punishments. Uh, and um, then I start, when I mentioned this on a blog posting, I started to hear from all these scholars from other fields saying, oh, there's much more uh, evidence for a decline of violence than you even realized. Did you know that rates of death in warfare have plunged in the last 20 years? Someone else said, oh, and rates of child abuse are down, and spousal abuse, and rape, and spanking. And I thought, all of these historical forces seem to be pushing in a single direction. What is going on? Well, was your first inclination, no, that can't be? Uh, absolutely. It was. You're like everybody else. Uh, absolutely. And then yes. you looked at it. You're, uh, we can have a pretty good understanding and indication of what the death count was in the 20th century because we keep pretty good records in the 20th century. How can you really know how much violence or what the death toll would have been, you know, two millennia ago? Yeah, you certainly can't know it to any degree of precision. But uh, governments have always been interested in taxes, and so they've always kept the best records they could as to who owes and who doesn't. And when you have a war and the tax records go down by uh, a third, uh, that's telling you something. Uh, they also, they're interested in, in uh, conscription, and uh, they often do censuses for taxation. Uh, and also, uh, scientists are used to imprecision in exact numbers but still try to get an order of magnitude or ballpark estimate. You can often take a set of estimates, look at the highest, look at the lowest, uh, take a geometric mean between them or take a median, and it's unlikely that the correct value, uh, unless it's grossly distorted, is going to be too different from something in the middle of the range. Well, okay, and you've got 700 pages that back up what you're saying right here. Having said that, I can still see people at home saying, wait a second, 20th century. World War I, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, colonial wars in Africa, Vietnam, killing fields of Cambodia, Rwanda, Iran, I mean, the 20th century, we killed 100 million people in the 20th century. How, how can this, how can what you say be true? Well, for one thing, the 20th century has 100 years, not just 50. And a lot of these events, like, like the Second World War, uh, were bunched up in the middle decades of the 20th century. The second half of the 20th century has astonished historians by the disappearance of war between great powers and war between rich countries. And these are the ones who used to be able to do the most damage because they were, they were rich and powerful. Germany, France. Uh, that's England. right. Yeah, and so it's, now it's, you know, no one would expect, say, Germany and France to fight a war. But that's a very unusual state of affairs that we feel this way. Also, you gave a list of the, uh, some of the worst outbreaks of violence in this century, but you can also create lists of hor horrible outbreaks of violence in earlier centuries. Uh, if you only concentrate on one century, then you don't have a trend. You've got one point. You go back to the 19th century, the worst war in American history by far, the Civil War. The Napoleonic Wars, one of the worst wars in, in uh, European history. The conquest of Shaka Zulu in southern Africa, one to two million uh, deaths. The worst civil war in world history took place in China, the Taiping Rebellion. No one's even heard of it. Uh, uh, how many people here. killed in that? Maybe 20 people, 20 million people. 20 uh, million people how many yeah. years ago? Uh, this was uh, maybe a little, uh, about 140 years ago. Okay, so uh, 20 million people 140 years ago. Which is, is even more as a proportion of the population. Right. And that and, is part of your point, isn't it? That as a percentage of the population, you know, uh, I, I guess 1,000 uh, deaths 2,000 years ago. 
That's right. If you think of yourself, what are the chances that I would die of violence if I was, say, time transported back and plunked on the surface of the earth as a random person in some earlier period, uh, how likely would it have happened to me? But even in absolute numbers, the, the numbers have gone down uh, in uh, warfare, for example. So nowadays in, in uh, warfare, the death tolls are in the tens of thousands. In the, the Vietnam War, it was two to three million people killed, depending on how you count. Hmm. Do you think we are inherently violent, though? Uh, I think that we are both inherently violent and inherently peaceable. The reason I call the book The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, borrowing a phrase from Abraham Lincoln, is that it captures the idea that we aren't just one thing. Their human nature has multiple parts. There are our inner demons that incline us toward violence, urges like dominance, revenge, exploitation. Uh, but then there are parts of human nature that inhibit us from violence, self-control, empathy, reason, a sense of fairness. And uh, even though you're right that the people often frame the question as uh, are human beings inherently violent or peaceful, I think it's the wrong question because human nature is more than one thing. Wouldn't be the first time I've asked the question improperly. But that's okay. <laughs> it is a reasonable, f I should ask you, isn't it a reasonable fear to be a victim of crime? And even though the statistics may indicate that our chances of being victims of crime today is less than it's ever been, is it still a reasonable fear to have that? Well, it's reasonable to, to, to be prudent and not to walk in the most dangerous parts of the city in the, in the, in the middle of the night. Uh, but it's not reasonable in the sense that if you're assessing all of the things that you could do to live as long as possible, probably being a victim of uh, violence in a place like Canada should be low on the list compared to making sure you don't have a loose rug on stairways, making sure you put on your seatbelt, wear a helmet if you ride a bicycle, because far more people die from accidents than from violence. Hmm. Is part of the explanation here as well, we are morally more enlightened these days than we were? I think we do care about more uh, kinds of harm, and one of the reasons that we think that there's more violence is we define more categories of behavior as violence. My favorite example is the recent campaign to stamp out bullying, hmm. uh, which I'm all in favor of, but 25 years ago, that wouldn't have been it would have counted as violence. Mm -hmm. That would have counted as childhood. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, capital punishment. The idea that the uh, United States is a, um, engaged in terrific, terrible crimes against humanity because it gives a lethal injection to about 45 people a year in a country that has 17,000 homicides. We call that state violence, and, and it is state violence, but 100 years ago, that would have been called justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would have been far more frequent for a far greater range of crimes, not all of them murder, and it would have been far bloodier. It would have been firing squad or the noose. And before that, the stake, the, the wheel, uh, and a lot of punishments that I'm not going to mention on the air because they'll give people nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, can we really claim to be more morally enlightened today when you look around the world and my goodness, there's a hell of a lot of misery, and much of it goes by, and we seem not to care about a lot of it. Well, I think we care more now than we did in the past. So the, one question is, are we morally angels now? Are we perfect? And clearly, we aren't. But if you're asking, are we morally more enlightened than we used to be, by many measures we are. Uh, there, we, there was racial segregation in the American South until with, up, up through our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, homosexuality was a crime and, and uh, gay people were put in jail. Uh, this is just, uh, women were beaten up and no one seemed to think it was anyone's business, but it was just a, a family matter. And these are just things in the last few decades to say nothing of burning heretics at the stake or sawing witches in half or enslaving tens of millions of Africans. Hmm. The creation of the modern state. Talk to us about how you think that reduced the amount of violence in the world. Yes, well, state, I, I think humanity is caught between two horrible extremes, one of them being anarchy, the other of them being tyranny. Uh, and got, uh, of, of the two, probably anarchy is worse in terms of the likelihood that you will be uh, killed. Hmm. But, uh, but tyranny can be pretty bad, too. Uh, the first states reduced rates of tribal raiding and feuding by a lot, by at least a factor of five, not because the first kings had a benevolent interest in the welfare of their, their uh, citizens, but just because tribal warfare is a nuisance to overlords. 
just as a farmer wants to prevent his livestock from killing each other, because it's just a dead loss to him. He doesn't <laughs> care about their disputes. Uh, so the early kings and emperors tried to stamp out raiding and feuding within their territories. The better they should have slaves and soldiers and taxes. But it did serve to lower rates of violence. So, so the uh, having chipped away at uh, anarchy, the next task, if you, if you will, for the human race was to chip away at tyranny. And you can think of democracy, decent government, as a kind of sweet spot between the two extremes of uh, despotism and anarchy. Good legal system? You put that on the list as Good well? Good legal system, absolutely. It doesn't have to be perfect, but uh, the alternative is the, the Sopranos or the Corleones or the American <laughs> Wild West, mm. where if, uh, if either the state is absent, uh, as in the cliche of the cowboy movies, that the nearest sheriff is 200 miles away, so you have to defend yourself with your six-shooter, or if you deal in a kind of business where you can't press a lawsuit uh, to defend your interests. If you think you've been cheated in a drug deal, you can't really hire a lawyer. Uh, if you think you've been threatened by a, another drug lord, you can't dial 911 and bring in the cops. And so you have to defend yourself with uh, violence or the credible threat of violence. And so even as long as the criminal justice system is not intimidated by the mafia, the mafia kingpins, and has at least some degree of autonomy, then it means that rates of violence will be lower. Having said that, we still seem to have a psychological bias or imperative even to find fault and to do something about that. Would you agree with that? Find fault just in each other in general? You know, a moralizing gap, I guess, is the way you refer to it. Yes, that's right. So we are, we're basically spend much of our lives as um, either kind of lawyers for the plaintiff or lawyers mm -hmm. for the defendant. We're constantly uh, telling people who have uh, harmed us or telling third parties how evil and perfidious and nasty they are, how innocent and pure we were. If we do something bad, it was in justified retaliation. If they do something bad, it's senseless, naked aggression. Uh, and we're always playing to uh, a gallery of, of virtual jurors pressing our case, which is one of the reasons why, despite all the amount of evil uh, in the world, no one actually thinks that what they're doing is evil as they're doing it. <laughs> right. Well, it, does that have something to do with the civilizing process, as you've referred to it in the book? Well, the civilizing process, which um, a term that I got from the German sociologist Norbert Elias, who wrote a, a book way ahead of its time on the decline of violence in Europe, he didn't have those numbers available to him showing that, that homicide declined by at least a factor of 30. But he could tell just from woodcuts, from narratives, from uh, histories, that something changed uh, after, during the Middle Ages. Uh, it was probably the consolidation of state control by, uh, by governments. Medieval Europe started off as kind of a patchwork of principalities and baronies and duchies and fiefdoms, and then eventually kings exerted control. And when they did, they imposed their own justice over the territory. And that put an end to the era of knights constantly plundering each other's territory and hacking each other to bits and abducting women and killing peasants. Uh, Elias argued that this led to a, a psychological change, that people, in, uh, in order to get ahead, instead of proving that they were the baddest, toughest knight in the area, they had to kiss up to the king, and they had to cultivate manners suitable to the court, which was, were called courtly manners or courtesy. Uh, and a premium was put on self-control and empathy, as opposed to impulsive uh, violence and a culture of honor. To that end, you don't mind if I quote from your book, do you? I didn't think you would. Here's, this is very cute, uh, an etiquette guide written by the Dutch scholar Erasmus in the year 1530, and his advice was pretty good. Uh, don't foul the staircases, corridors, closets, or wall hangings with urine or other filth. Don't relieve yourself in front of ladies or before doors or windows of court chambers. Don't carry your handkerchief in your mouth. Don't offer anyone a piece of food you have bitten into. Don't pick your nose while eating. Apparently, we were a very gross people not that long ago. Uh, but does this have anything to do with violence, though? It might. And this was Elias' uh, hypothesis. And I think there is some evidence in favor of it, namely that self-control is, like is a bit like a muscle, that if you bulk it up in uh, waiting till everyone sits down at the table before you chow down, 
Uh, if you uh, wait and you find a discreet area before you unbutton your pants and relieve yourself, that it will spill over so that if you are... So to speak. In, <laughs> bad choice of words. <laughs> uh, if you're insulted, if you have a sudden dispute over the dinner table, maybe you won't reach for your dagger and, and cut off someone's nose. Maybe you'll count to ten and wait till the feeling passes. And, of course, as a psychologist, I, I recognize a, a psychological hypothesis. This was a, a theory about what makes people tick. And I went to the literature and I found that, that uh, indeed, if you get people to exert more self-control in, in areas like putting away the dishes uh, the, or um, uh, submitting their term papers on time, then they become more self-disciplined in other ways, like saving money rather than spending it and watching their calories. Is self-control similar to a muscle that you might exercise at the gym? In, in a way it is. That uh, research by Roy Baumeister has found that when you give people uh, regimes of uh, bulking up their self-control, it uh, transfers to other aspects of their lives and you live a less slovenly lifestyle across the board. He's also shown that violence uh, can come from a, a lack of self-control. If you, you can, uh, uh, as with a muscle, you can fatigue self-control. That is, if you have someone come into the lab hungry and you bake a, a heaping plate of chocolate chip cookies, but you tell them that they can't, uh, they can't indulge, they just got to look at the cookies and, and not eat, then it tuckers out their self-control and then they are more likely to do things like blow their payment for the experiment on uh, Doritos or, or poker chips. <laughs> They are, and more relevant to the issue of violence, they're more likely to shock another subject, or at least think they're shocking them, or to put more hot sauce in his uh, sandwich. Uh, or even in their fantasy life, they say, okay, now imagine you're standing in a, in a bar with your girlfriend, another guy comes up to you, starts flirting with your girlfriend, she seems to enjoy it, there's a beer bottle, what do you do with the beer bottle? If your self-control has been fatigued by resisting the chocolate chip cookies, in your fantasy, you're more, more likely to grab for the beer bottle and smash it over your rival's head. Would you do that ever? Uh, I, I don't think I would do that. I'm nope. too much of a wimp. <laughs> <laughs> the presence, or lack thereof, of women. How much does that have an influence over whether men are violent? Well, men are by far the more violent gender. Uh, little this boys... just in. Uh, yes. <laughs> boys fight more than girls, uh, men have more violent fantasies, men commit the lion's share of the violence in all human societies. Uh, wh what are they fighting over? Well, they're fighting over the, uh, sometimes fighting directly over women, uh, sometimes fighting over the prestige and status that tends to win women. In male-only environments, <coughs> you tend to get much greater violence because, first of all, the women are scarce and only the toughest, baddest men will get them. Also, when men and women have to live together, uh, women don't take a lot of pleasure in watching men uh, duke it out for stupid contests of status. And so women tend to, this sounds like an old fashioned notion, but there's a lot to it, that women tend to be a civilizing force. Mm -hmm. Men have to behave in the presence of women when women uh, c control access to th themselves, to their own sexuality. And in many violent parts of the world, when women were empowered, rates of violence went down. So it is definitely a male fantasy, this notion of, you know, we're going to fight to the death or fight a duel over this woman, that she likes that. She doesn't well, like that. Uh, uh, it, it, the male fantasy would be to probably have a harem of several hundred women that you've already won. <laughs> 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 and the, the women may not mind the men uh, competing over each other, although competing with each other, uh, if, if the competition consists of wooing her, being the best uh, mate, the, uh, the, the best father, uh, if they're just killing each other, including you know, brothers and, and fathers and so on, then it's kind of a waste of resources from her point of view. Gotcha. Uh, Michael, we're at uh, the top of page four here. Let's bring up this latest quote from The Better Angels of Our Nature from Steven Pinker. People today are far from morally immaculate. They may covet nice objects, fantasize about sex with inappropriate partners, or want to kill someone who humiliated them in public. But other sinful desires no longer occur to people in the first place. Most people today have no desire to watch a cat burn to death, let alone a man or a woman. In that regard, we are different from our ancestors of only a few centuries ago, who approved, carried out, 
and even savored the infliction of unspeakable agony on other living beings. Talk to us about this humanitarian revolution that has allowed that change to happen over a few hundred years. Yes, a lot of it was concentrated in a 50-year period, the second half of the 18th century, the time of the European Enlightenment, in which there was a, a, a cascade of reforms, that uh, most of which originated in Europe but then spread to the rest of the world. The abolition of uh, cruel punishments like breaking on the wheel or burning at the stake, the abolition of slavery, the um, replacement of despotism by democracy, the first arguments for animal rights, for gay rights, uh, the uh, ending of debtors' prisons. Uh, all of them came from ideas that became popular in the second half of the 18th century, possibly because of the wide uh, dissemination of uh, books and pamphlets and even novels. People were literate for the first time uh, in large numbers. The technology of printing books had become way cheaper, kind of an early application of Moore's Law that the efficiency doubled every uh, couple, every decade. And it's possible, first of all, that if you, are, if you have a literate population, they're less likely to uh, believe in nonsense such as that Jews poison wells or that witches cause crop failures or Africans are, are brutish. Um, ign ignorance gets replaced by knowledge. But also, as you start to read about what it's like to be someone else, you read a first-person account of what it's like to be a slave. You read about... Uh, histories of other places where exactly the kind of things that your leaders are saying, their leaders said, and look what happened to them. It gives you some perspective, and it encourages people to reflect on uh, other people's lives, to reflect on the way they live their own lives. And I think it went into this cascade of reforms that began around the time of the Enlightenment. And yet, some of the most sadistic people in our world today are 11, 12, 13, 14-year-old <laughs> kids in a schoolyard who, on occasion, text or bully or do whatever it takes to get other children to kill themselves. How do we explain that, and yet this humanitarian revolution at the same time? Well, we haven't been, been converted into, into angels, uh, and there's still uh, violence that remains, but there's still a big difference between saying nasty things uh, on a text message and uh, sawing a person in half or burning them at the stake. Granted, okay. Uh, so our, our standards have risen too, and so we're likely to identify things like cyberbullying as a form of violence, which really doesn't, doesn't compare to the violence of centuries past. Hmm. Here's uh, another uh, excerpt from your book. We're calling this Victory of the Flower Child. Believe it or not, from a global, historical, and quantitative perspective, the dream of the 1960s folk songs has come true. The world has almost put an end to war. One word question. Really? <laughs> The almost is important. <laughs> war ha yes, if you look at the number of people killed in war every year, it is a tiny fraction of what it was in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s. That was lower than what it was in the 50s, and that was a fraction of what it was in, in uh, World War II. So quantitatively, fewer people are dying in battle. Also, for in large parts of the world, it's just been taken off the table as, as an option. If uh, Canada has a dispute with... Uh, Spain over flatfish, uh, it's really unlikely that there's going to be an all-out war between them. But uh, 100, 200 years ago, European countries would go to war over trade issues at the drop of a hat. Now it would be almost a, a bad joke to say, should we declare war on, uh, on Spain? Uh, so Western countries, rich countries, and uh, great powers have basically put war off the table. It still exists in the form of civil wars, in the form of often of, of policing wars, where, like in Libya or uh, Iraq or Afghanistan, where a great power might think that it can do the country some good by toppling a, a, a dictatorship. But um, even those wars kill far fewer people than the uh, clash of the titans that we used to see when great powers fought each other. Seems to be a, a, uh, an understanding post World War II that. Back then, it was expected that you would target hundreds of thousands of civilians and kill as many civilians as you can in order to get the other side, as Ronald Reagan would say, to say uncle. Yes. Nowadays, you can't, I mean, civilians get killed, but you can't target them today, can you? That, and that is a difference, um, far, far less. We have the, the uh, euphemism that we all recoil from of collateral damage. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there is less collateral damage. The, the idea of carpet bombing enemy cities, which was done as recently as uh, Vietnam, or firebombing as in the Second World War, 
that uh, is something that, that countries uh, avoid nowadays. And so as horrific as drones are, when you remember what the alternative is, that instead of uh, uh, sending a rocket that targets just the man you want and the driver, instead you pulverize the entire city to get at him, and you just don't care about what happens to all the people who die in the crossfire. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it really is a change. Well, you t we talked a lot of numbers here. The number that you like to quote the most, I think, post-1945, in terms of the history of warfare, is zero. Yeah. What does that mean? Uh, so at least since 1953, zero wars between great powers. The Korean War was the, was the last. Zero wars between Western European countries, which doesn't sound like a big deal until you r remember that Western European countries started a new war at a rate of two a year for 600 years. After 1945, that went to zero. That's a, that's a big <laughs> difference. Zero nuclear weapons have been used uh, in battle since Nagasaki. Now, uh, again, that uh, we kind of take that for granted now, but it wasn't so long ago that the experts were predicting that nuclear warfare was, was certain, just a matter of time when it was going to happen. Uh, and uh, zero wars between rich countries, countries with the highest, the 45 countries with the highest GDP per capita have not fought a war. Again, that, see, the fact that it seems so obvious it itself tells a story. We think, oh yeah, wars are things that happen in those primitive parts of the world. But it used to be the rich countries that were constantly at each other's throats, and rich countries can afford big armies with destructive weapons that do much more damage. Okay, a couple follow-ups here. Um, you know, the Cold War may not have actually seen Soviet troops fire on American troops, but their proxies certainly did a hell of a lot of damage to each other. So you're not including that in the, the great powers have never gone to war post-World War II? Well, uh, it's not that you don't, don't count them at all, because obviously there, there were those proxy wars. Um, but the two countries fighting each other on the battlefield, that's what didn't happen. And that isn't, that isn't a, 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 a trivial observation, because mm -hmm. as horrible as Vietnam was, a war between uh, Western Europe and the Soviet Union, or the United States and the Soviet Union, would have had orders of magnitude more casualties. And what about the Balkans? That doesn't count? Well, it's not a great power war, or a, or a, a war between not even developed a, countries. Not even a well-off country war? No? Uh, uh, not f the um, the prob former provinces of Yugoslavia mm -hmm. probably wouldn't have counted as the 45 uh, highest GDP per capita, is my guess. I'm okay. going to have to look it up. But, yeah. uh, Immanuel Kant, Perpetual Peace, the essay. What lessons do you take from that? So here was a German philosopher writing more than 200 years ago who threw out a number of hypotheses as to what could encourage peace. And this was not you know, brotherhood and sitting around a circle swaying back and forth or wearing peace signs. These were what he thought were practical measures that would remove the incentives of countries to fight wars, and therefore better than hoping that they'll just become more uh, pacifist over time. So one of them was democracy. Uh, he, he predicted that as the world got more democratic, it would be less likely to wage wars, partly because if leaders are responsible to their citizens, they're less likely to get involved in stupid wars that bring glory to them, but it's the, the people who supply the cannon fodder. Hmm. Another was uh, trade, that if you had countries that traded with each other, each would have a selfish stake in the well-being of the other. That is, you, you, you want the market, you want the supply of goods. I mean, a modern example might be why I think it's unlikely that the United States and China will fight a war, even though there's not a whole lot of affection between the two countries, and one of them is not democratic. Uh, Which one? But, <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 knew that was, I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, they make too much of our stuff, and we owe them too much money. Mm -hmm. go, going to war would be like going to war with ourselves, and we don't have to be particularly <laughs> noble about it. It just would be a stupid thing to do. I can't remember whose book I read it in, but the, but there's this McDonald's notion of foreign policy as well. Yes. No two countries with a McDonald's restaurant have ever gone to war with each other. That, that's right. Uh, and um, uh, Tom Friedman from the New York Times. Did Friedman say uh, that? And it's almost true. You could you know you could argue about definitions, but uh, when the NATO bombed uh, Yugoslavia. That may have right. been the one counterexample. Gotcha. But it's more or less true. Uh, and uh, he said an international community. If when uh, governments belong to uh, associations, not only the United Nations, but even associations to, for trade, for canals, for postage, for signage, uh, when uh, foreign ministers are rubbing shoulders with each other and are part of a community, they're less likely to uh, go to war. And at least statistically, all three of those hypotheses seem to have been borne out. Um, 
a, uh, Bruce Russett and John O'Neill did a big regression analysis mm -hmm. and showed that Kant, Kant got it right three out of three times. Hmm. How many years ago? Uh, this is 1795. So. A little ahead of his time. Yeah. Let's spend our uh, remaining moments here on the rights revolution because it really picked up steam, of course, after World War II. <clears throat> and I wonder how much violence do you think there was actually left to curtail from that moment on? Yes, uh, the, I, I think uh, Western societies have uh, turned their sights on smaller and smaller categories of violence. That is, um, not on the scale of genocides and uh, world wars, but still things that cause a great deal of human suffering. Spanking of children, the use of corporal punishment in schools like paddling and, and uh, strapping. Domestic violence, not a trivial category of violence. Rape uh, on, on, on the streets and in the home. Uh, uh, racial violence, like in the United States lynchings and hate crimes of intimidation, uh, even uh, cruelty to animals in labs and farms. All of these have become targets of moralistic denunciation campaigns, and they've often been successful. They're not just um, uh, feel-good measures, but the rate of rape uh, came down 80% since the 1970s when it was first measured. Domestic violence, way down. Uh, uh, victimization of children on the playground, down. Uh, lynching was eliminated. It, there used to be 150 lynchings a year in the United States at the end of the 19th century. By 1950, that had gone down to zero. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, the animal welfare revolution, is that kind of the next frontier on this thing? I think it will be one of the next frontiers. It's already revolutionized the way animals are treated in laboratories. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's... Uh, increased the number of uh, vegetarians. It's brought down the number of animals harmed in motion pictures. <laughs> I, even have, I even have a graph of that. I know, I've uh, seen that. It starts up here, then it goes down and straight across. That's right. Yeah. So you no longer can have a scene in a movie about uh, horses plunging on cliffs by actually filming horses plunging right. off cliffs. You they, need to use computer animation or, uh, or other substitutes. And the disclaimer now, at the end of the movie all the time now. That, no well, animals were harmed. And it, it's been effective, yeah. Hmm. But of course, there's still a, a, a huge way to go given the sheer number of animals that we raise and slaughter on, uh, on factory farms. Hmm. But I suspect that will be the next frontier. And already, even in the United States, which uh, tends not to like to restrict commercial activity, a number of plebiscites have passed that restrict the way farmers can treat their poultry and uh, livestock. Hmm. There, there is a, and maybe I'm just inferring this and you're not implying it, but I'm certainly inferring that the march you are describing is inexorable. But I wonder if that's true. I mean, there was the, you know, Pax Romana a couple of thousand years ago, which, you know, led to the Dark Ages. Yeah. Uh, is it really inexorable, that which you're describing? I don't think it's inexorable. I think it's, um, I, I think there are pressures in that direction, but it's not some mystical force that's going to carry us uh, on, on its own accord. It depends on institutions that have to be in place. If the institutions collapse, then we could go right back. The general intelligence of the population continuing to improve presumably is a huge foundation for what you're describing as well. Yeah, hard as it is to believe, IQ scores went up throughout the 20th century, and by a lot, by about three points a decade. Uh, and uh, so that the population at the end of the 20th century was uh, about 30 points higher than the population at the beginning. Hmm. Not in all aspects of intelligence, but in abstract reasoning, and similarities and, and analogies. And I went out on a limb and suggested that this was not unrelated to changes in attitudes that if you really think about it, it's hard to justify putting homosexuals in prison. It's hard to justify racial segregation or, and, and the kinds of intimidation that helped enforce it. It's hard to say that there's nothing wrong with a husband raping his wife or beating up his wife. Uh, it's hard to argue that, you, that it's really okay to uh, smack your children with, with weapons. And I think as issues get debated, as people think more abstractly, like, how would I feel if I were in the place of that victim of violence? Then people are going to rethink the way they run their lives, what's acceptable, what isn't. And I think that has been a force that's been behind the rights revolutions. In our last 30 seconds then, uh, given how far we've come in the last 300 years, do you have any uh, prognostications about where you think we may be on this continuum 300 years from now? I think violence against women is going to go down in much of the world. Uh, I think there's probably going to be more democracies. I don't think we're going to return to the Middle Ages in terms of rates of homicide or barbaric practices like 
braking on the, on the wheel. I think probably human trafficking will go down because all of them have been targets of uh, reform campaigns. And in the past, they have succeeded. However, um, terrorism, the seven billion people, who knows what one fanatic might do. Yeah. Civil war, again, unpredictable. And if there's a collapse, a widespread collapse of a civilization, again, uh, it could go back to the, to the Middle Ages. Stephen Picker, it's awfully good of you to spend so much time with us at TVO here tonight. Your latest is called The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. And it really has. And I think maybe the greatest thing about this last 35 minutes is you didn't take one swig from that glass of water. <laughs> I don't know how you did it, but you did it. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.